CD99, we're here with Holden Jaffe, a.k.a. Del Water Gap. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, man. How you doing? Oh, not so bad. It's a, a, a real pleasure to have your song, uh, Ode to a Conversation Stuck in Your Throat, uh, on the air here at CD99. I remember discovering your music late 2020, like summer to late 2021, and uh, to see it come so far. We were just talking a second ago, like it's getting a second wind. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's surreal. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a third wind, because um, the song came out you know, early in the pandemic, and it sort of fell flat. And I was uh, I was living in Maine on the beach, and I really believed in the song, and it came out, and you know, like my mom and her friends heard it, and that was about it. And I was like, cool, like COVID, take it easy for a bit, watch Tiger King, take a step back from music, and uh, and a couple friends started texting me, and they were like, go on Instagram, and I went on, and um, there was this video of Margaret Qualley and Caitlin Dever, who are two badass actresses, and they had made a. <laughs> a socially distant dance party to my song yeah and it was sweet you know a couple like uh press outlets covered it and gracie abrams ended up covering the song and it was amazing it was sort of like the artistic co-sign that got the song out into the world again which was beautiful and like being having your art you know validated by artists you respect is always the best that's super cool there's that there's i mean speaking of great co-signs i think around the same time florence Pugh. Uh, caught one of your songs as well had some nice things to say about it uh, do you see yeah. she's making music she's about to release some stuff yeah i mean we sort of became friends after she found my music and and she had been telling me she was a writer and had been singing a bit so i'm stoked that she's actually putting something together yeah i heard you mention a couple of seconds ago that uh you lived in maine you've lived a ton of places i'd kind of like to walk it back to uh, holden before delwater gap holden before delwater gap yeah this might have been during like the early phases of Delwater Gap too, as well, uh, where you find yourself in New York City, kind of doing odd jobs to uh, kind of get by. They're all really wacky odd jobs that I learned about. One of them teaching Photoshop to it was said in the article like old ladies. Was it all yeah. old ladies? Yeah, it was all old ladies. Yeah, I mean, I had I had so many hustles. My my grandma who's ninety seven and, and doing great. She's her and I are very close. She's the one other artist in my family. Um, and I would always help her with tech support stuff. I'd set up her internet and, you know, she'd tell me something was broken and it just needed, you know, it just needed to X out of a window or two. But, you know, a couple of her friends started getting a little jealous that she had a, a young grandson who was tech savvy. So she uh, she started pimping me out a little bit. Um, and, I, yeah, I would just go over to friends of hers houses and, you know, just just help them help them. Yeah, get through their computer <laughs> world. And then, you know, my name started getting passed around and all of a sudden I had this full, you know, full week schedule of visiting these Upper East Side old ladies. And it was great. This sort of rent controlled New York City Upper East Side apartments is a very cool little corner. You know, you have all these these old ladies that moved in in the 50s, you know, and so they're living in these crazy apartments up there and you walk in and they look like they're something straight out of the 1970s. So. Yeah, that was definitely a fun chapter. Your grandma, I, from what I know about her, seems just exceptionally cool. I heard you mention a while back, like she helped you conceptualize one of the music videos that you shot in a barn because she has like a story, decades long uh, career in film. How important was that to, to see in that vision through? Yeah, so important. She's, yeah, we, we were always really close when I was growing up. And then as I became an artist, she was, she was a real... Um, ally for me my parents are not artists so they were always uh very reverent and kind and supportive but a little bit confused and she's uh yeah she always really pushed me and she still does and you know she's a she's a really talented creator in her own right she uh she made a lot of music documentaries in the 1970s and 80s she made some films about leonard bernstein and stravinsky and to this day, I sent her a lot of my in progress music, which she is very honest about. She'll uh, she'll be very quick to be like, "Yeah, this is you need to start over." I'm so sorry. So, <laughs> <Well. laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> I just sent her a song I wrote about her. She was like, "Yeah, this is okay. It's pretty good." <laughs> Savage. That's a pretty cool uh, thing to have, though, in your corner, something like that. Not only to be supportive, but also to have such a a sharp mind on it. So. Uh, you you wind up moving to New York City, which is kind of a dream for a lot of like artists in the Midwest. I mean, artists all over the country, really. But you, you move to the big city and you imagine like a space in Brooklyn, like some really tight like art scene with a bunch of great collaborators. 
And I understand in your case, it wasn't exactly that. It was like split between that sort of scene at NYU and recording spaces in Times Square. <laughs> how did that happen? What was the, how did you get kind of pulled into that? I mean, you're right. Moving to New York was was a dream. I grew up in a really small town. My parents lived between two dairy farms. So I grew up with not much in the way of internet or anything much to do besides walk around outside and play guitar, which was a blessing. Um, but moving to New York was a huge shift. I bought a pair of boots. I bought a leather jacket. I bought electric guitar and I was yeah. off to the races. <laughs> That's so cool. Drank my first 40, you know. But yeah, I went to music school. I went to a school called Clive Davis there, which, um, you know, they teach you songwriting. They also give you sort of a proper liberal arts education, which I appreciated being able to take literature classes and such. Yeah, I think I think to your point, most importantly, the, uh, the scene there was really what allowed me to incubate and become the artist I am. Um, I feel really lucky to have had that at that time because you know, scene is something that I think people are talking about a lot right now, post COVID, about what was lost when we were not able to be in scenes together. Mm -hmm. It's such a way to improve as an artist and build your identity and and get competitive with people in a way that I think makes you get up and write and make music. And um, so, yeah, I was playing in a lot of bands around the East Village. Uh, I, I sort of moved to New York during the last dying breaths of that New York uh, indie rock scene. I was playing shows with uh you know public access tv and see the strokes wow. out at uh at, at bars and the yeah. virgins you know so it was it was a lot of that and i started gigging and then um yeah midway through through college i met i i learned about pop music <laughs> uh i i started meeting some songwriters and producers who were you know playing that game and trying to get songs cut with major label artists and I realized that I was not the indie snob I thought I was, that I actually loved pop music. Uh, 1989 came out around then and blew my mind open. So I started working uh, with with a group of writers and producers there. And as you mentioned, in Times Square, there was a studio pretty much overlooking the TKTS booth. And we would work there nights, you know, like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And it would be there would be so much neon light coming in the windows that it felt like the afternoon. It was this sort of sickening wow. blue glow. <laughs> but uh, it was really where I, when I learned to write and produce music, you know, I learned how to be self-sufficient and sit down in front of a computer and, and make a record. So it was a really valuable time. You touched on something that I feel like a lot of people, including myself, get wrong, which is uh, that pop music is good. I mean, <laughs> we, spend, we spend our whole life uh, like kind of looking down upon like, oh, you know, whatever, it fe seems easy uh, to be accessed. And then uh, you realize that uh, pretty much everybody in pop music that makes good pop music started with like a very hyper specific approach. And then. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to be a snob early on, because I think when you're building your identity and your taste and you're figuring out if you have taste and what your taste is, I mean, that sounds fucking snobby if you have taste, everyone has taste. But I think sure. when you're when you're building your identity. And trying to figure out who you are, I think it's really important to be exclusionary <laughs> yeah. because I think otherwise you you don't have any sort of direction, you know, and I, I think it's 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 so brilliant about, um, you know, I have some cousins who are a bit younger who went to high school and I, I love spending time with them because it's such a reminder that when you're that age, you you choose, you know, a lot of people choose something and they stick to it. You know, you have like emo kids, you have indie kids, you have, you know, and it's it's such a brilliant thing that I think we sometimes spend our adulthood trying to work back to, you know, like really finding a world to, uh, to exist in and, and create in and live in. Yeah. That's a really beautiful approach that you take to it. Like, I think the, just the avenue of like sonic, uh, energy from like a, a hyper specific focus and finding out who you are and the subjectivity of your taste and then expanding it. It's kind of like a microcosm of the way that we as humans are right like to... totally yeah yeah i mean it's our instinct you know it's it's the it's the part of us that uh creates fandom and you know it gets fifty thousand people out to a football game you know it's we we uh we stick in tribes and we we obsess together and uh and yeah it's beautiful do you watch much football i don't i i grew up uh with my my dad uh you know, I have so many memories of like lying on the couch with him and watching football, but I was gloriously bad at sports growing up. And so I always felt a bit alienated, <laughs> which, uh, which, you know, ultimately brought me to music. Um, I do. Uh, I'm going to be on tour during the Super Bowl 
and my tour manager has been um you know scheduling us a a, a bar hang for that sunday um mm. so we're gonna be uh we're gonna be drinking beer and watching football that that part of football you know i'm a huge fan of yeah that's that's the great part that's the, the lying down on the couch and taking it in <laughs> passively yeah Right. Well, yeah, you're going out on tour uh, here pretty shortly with uh, Maggie Rogers, who um, I'm sure some of our listeners might not know. Uh, you two are very tight. Uh, she was an original member of Delawada Gap, like in the first like lineup iteration of the project. Right. Um, and you produced Want Want. I, I have to know how you felt watching that video of Pharrell. We went to college together. And so that video was was shot as part of our a college class that we had. So I was actually in the room and that was shot and it was absolutely surreal. Yeah, the surprise guest that day was Pharrell to come listen to our music. So it, it was really wild to see. And at that point, we, um, you know, like you mentioned, I had started Daughter Gap in college, but I had no real intentions of playing any shows. I was really shy. I hadn't really sung in public. And she was the first person that sat me down and said, you know, these songs are really good and you should you should go play them. And I said, no. <laughs> and she <laughs> said, okay, what if I played them with you? And I said, okay, maybe. So uh, we we played the first few Delaware Gap shows together. She sang with me, which was beautiful. And then ended up, uh, you know, obviously splitting off to go do her own thing. But um, yeah, we, we reconnected a few years ago, that song Want One and another song called Anywhere With You came out of that and they ended up on the album. So um yeah i mean it's i'm such a fan of hers you know our friendship aside i think she's a brilliant artist and uh working with friends is also you know one of the greatest gifts so it, it's it's been a really beautiful situation and and she invited me to do this tour a few months ago and i'm so excited i mean she has the best fans and it's uh i get to play a few a few cities i've never been before in the in the u.s or playing new orleans i've never played um you know, going back to New York and LA, I get to play Radio City, which is an absolute dream as someone that, you know, came up in New York. Yeah, I, I was going to ask specifically about Radio City. Um, I heard you talk about how huge it was to play the Bowery, for example, Yeah. to now Radio City Music Hall. Is there any box left unchecked? <laughs> like, Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I've been trying every year to have a check in and, and, and write down what my goals are. Yeah, Bowery was a huge one. I mean, that was really the goal in the album was to sell out Bowery Ballroom. Um, and I really wanted to play on TV and I got to do that. I played on South Myers. Um, I did a show at Webster Hall, which was another another big New York moment. Um, yeah, I, I mean, setting foot on the stage at Radio City is such an honor. I think the real dream is to headline it someday, which yeah. uh, I want to do in the next two years. But uh, for now, I'm I'm so happy to be supporting Maggie there. And yeah, I think uh, an another big dream of mine is to go to Australia and, and play in Asia. I, I love I love a lot of Japanese music and I've heard a lot of my friends who have played there have said it's like the most fun place to play. So yeah, God, that'd be awesome. Uh, hopefully your travels include fewer raccoons in the dressing room than at Red Rocks. <laughs> Can you tell us about this story? It's insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my first show back from COVID, my first show in two years was uh, was opening for Mount Joy at Red Rocks which was completely surreal because it was like, I never thought I'd play a show again. And then we got the call, you know, we were in the dressing room hanging out and, you know, eating our, eating our, our, our dinner. And then we left the dressing room to go. I think we were just catching up with someone and we came back like 10 or 15 minutes later, my guitar player, Nick's right in front of me. And he just yells raccoon. <laughs> and I look up and there's a raccoon sitting on the charcuterie plate, just like facing salami you know and we all started screaming and running around <laughs> we turned into like a bunch of little kids and the raccoon of course spooked but the only exit for the raccoon was straight at us so it fully charges at us and we just bolt into you know all the rooms coming off this hallway um Dear you God. know hiding in there and that was like three minutes before you went on stage right oh yeah we were walking on i had the most <laughs> it was completely shocking but you know i said it on stage but i looked it up you know right after and raccoons are a sign of a, a sign of good luck so i think it actually made the show go well that's amazing and then I, and then i famously after the fact was eating off the meat plate uh <laughs> forgetting what had happened <laughs> and there was this like slow motion dive where someone came over and slapped a bunch of uh charcuterie out of my hand to keep me I'm getting yeah. whatever the fuck I was going to get. No rabies taken. <laughs> exactly. If you're going to get rabies, you do not want to get it from salami. You know, you want to, you want it to happen in a more epic way. Yeah. You want a cool story out of it. Yeah, uh, well, right. from, 
from raccoons to horses, if I can make this segue, um, I learned about the horse with the bowl cut story, and I immediately, uh, like, my jaw dropped. Uh, one, can you tell us the, the horse with the bowl cut story? And I'll tell you the reason why uh, I was so shocked. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy you bring it up because I'm, I'm really trying to blow up horse with bowl cut this year. The whole thing started as a joke. I was I, I was uptown at a bakery with my friend Charlie Berg, who was a really wonderful musician, and he was sketching in a... Uh, a sketchbook he had um he was you know doing these figure drawings of people in the in the bakery i was really impressed and and i jokingly was like oh yeah i actually sketched too and i took this napkin that was on the table and i drew a picture it ended up being one of the more infantile and grotesque things i've ever drawn and it, it's it's essentially a horse uh, a stick figure of a horse with a bowl cut and and a smiley face and um I thought it was so funny at the time that I decided to try to sell it on my merch store, which I did. I put it on my merch store and I sold it for forty dollars. And <laughs> but before I sold it, I uh, I took a picture of it and I decided to make it my unofficial logo. And and since then, it's taken on a bit of a character of its own. I have a I have a fan club on Instagram, just as horse with bowl cut, and uh, it has become my my de facto uh, logo. So when we played golf ball, there was a forty foot horse with bowl cut behind me and. I tried to get it on Seth Meyers and they shot it down, but um, oh, no. <laughs> it, had, it, it, it has followed us everywhere. You know, if you've come to a Del Water Gap show in the last couple of years, you, you, you probably have seen the, the neon pink horse with bowl cut somewhere in the corner of the stage. The neon representation is really impressive. Yeah. It glows with a certain... Thank you. That was actually a gift from my label on the, the day my album came out. They gave me that and I almost cried. It was in my apartment for a while, and then we decided to take it on the road. So That's so cool. The reason that I bring it up today is because I read that story about you out with an impressive visual artist <laughs> drawing something kind of childlike. Exact same thing happened to me with a, a professional oil painter encouraging me to make a drawing. And I'm like, all right, you're going to regret asking me to do this. And instead of horse with bull cut, what I came up with was um, cow with sunglasses. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and oh it's like the same God. story. They are, they definitely know each other. They know each other. Oh my God. They're from this same, like bizarre Dolly esque <laughs> farmyard. Yeah. <laughs> love that. They, they exist within the same universe. They're friends. I Maybe love it. Maybe can get you a neon of it. That'd be a dream come true one of these days. <laughs> Uh, well, hey, uh, it looks like we've only got a, a few more minutes uh, with you this afternoon. So one thing that I always like to do is uh, run everybody through a quick lightning round here at the end, some rapid fire this or that questions to get in your head. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. We'll start easy. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Bop it, pull it, or twist it? <laughs> Bop it. Okay, classic, right in the center. <laughs> Who was the most famous influencer you took a photo of in the influencer photo booth of your past? Do a lip up. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Do you still have the picture? Yeah. I guess, I don't know if you're allowed to keep it. I could find it. It's, it's a GIF. Yeah. I got him a stone too. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. I'm picturing, I don't know if this is it, but I'm picturing that guy on TikTok with like the swooping camera. Oh, yeah. It's like that. It's completely like that. Are you still doing your weekly movie watching club with your grandma? And if so, what's the last film? I sure am. Yeah. I just watched After Sun, which was the film this week, which was really sad and beautiful and uh you should see it do you have any standouts like anything that was really on the top of your list yeah still my favorite movie we've seen is called tempopo everyone should see it it's a japanese western it's about a lot of things but it's a, it, it centers around food and sensuality and it's truly inspiring oh yeah uh, i'll check it out for sure the very last question that i like to ask everybody that i get some time with i'm working on a map here what do you consider to be the prettiest american state in terms of its geographical outline alone I think Montana. Hmm. I love it. I really love it. Yeah. I uh, when I was a kid, I had a I had a map of the U.S. on my wall, and I think Montana always really fascinated me. I don't think anybody's ever said Montana before. That's a, <laughs> that's a first. You get your face firmly planted on the map, Delwater Gap. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us today, uh, yeah. here in Columbus. We hope to see you uh, at some point in yeah. the future. Thanks for having me. Hey, this is Delwater Gap, and you're listening to Central Ohio's Alternative CD 92.9.